Hello, I am Mrs. Claycomb, the eighth grade counselor here at Crawford, and I'll be reading from our book, The Seed Folks, chapter two, and our character is Anna. I do love to sit and look out the window. Why do I need TV when I have 48 apartment windows to watch across the vacant lot and a sliver of Lake Erie? I've seen history out this window so much. I was four when we moved here in 1919. The fruit sellers, carts, and coal wagons were pulled down the street by horses back then. I used to stand just here and watch the coal brought up by the handsome lad from Groza, the village my parents were born in. Gibbs Street was mainly Romanians back then. It was adio, goodbye, in all the shops when you left. Then the Romanians started leaving. They weren't the first or the last. This has always been a working class neighborhood. It's like a cheap hotel. You stay until you've got enough money to leave. A lot of Slovaks and Italians moved in next. Then black families in the depression. Gibbs Street became the line between the blacks and whites, like a border between countries. I watched it happen through this very window. I lived over in Cleveland Heights for 18 years and I moved back in to take care of my parents. That border moved too. Most all the whites left. Then the steel mills and factories closed and everybody left like rats. Buildings abandoned, men with no work, drinking from nine to five instead, down there in the lot. Always the sirens, people killing each other. Now I see families from Mexico and Cambodia, countries I don't even know. 12 people sometimes in one apartment. New languages in the shops and on the street. These new people leave when they can like the others. I'm the only one staying. It's so. Staying and staring out the same window. This spring I looked out and I saw something strange. Down in the lot, a little black haired girl hiding behind the refrigerator. She was working at the dirt and looking around suspiciously all the time. And then I realized she was burying something. I never had children of my own, but I've seen enough in that lot to know she was mixed up in something she shouldn't be. And after 20 years typing for the parole department, I just about knew what she buried. Drugs, most likely. Or money. Or a gun. The next moment, she disappeared like a rabbit. I thought of calling up the police, and then I saw her there the next morning, and I decided I'd solve this case myself. We had a long spell of rain then. I didn't see eyes on her once. Then the weather turned warm, and I saw her twice more, always in the morning, on her way to school. She was crouched down with her back to me so I couldn't see just what she was doing. My curiosity was like a fever inside me. Then one morning she was there glancing about and she looked straight up at this window. I pulled my head back behind the curtain. I wasn't sure if she'd seen me. If she had, she wouldn't leave her treasure buried long. And then I knew I'd have to dig it up before she did. I waited an hour after she left and then I took an old butter knife and my cane and hobbled down all three flights of stairs. I worked my way through that awful jungle of junk and finally came to her spot. I stooped down, it was wet there and easy digging. I hacked and I dug but didn't find anything except for a large white bean. I tried a new spot and found another and then a third and then the truth of it slapped me full in the face. I said to myself, what have you done? Two beans had roots. I knew I'd done them harm. I felt like I'd read through her secret diary and had ripped out a page without meaning to. I laid those beans right back in that ground as gently as sleeping babies. Then I patted the soil as smooth as could be. The next morning, she was back. I peeked around the curtain. She didn't look up here or give any sign that she noticed something was wrong. I could see her clearly this time. She reached a hand into her school bag and then she pulled out a jar, unscrewed the lid, and poured out water onto the ground. That afternoon, I bought some but not worse. And that is chapter two, Anna's version of our seed books. I'd like to talk to you before we end this session. As part of restorative practices, we will learn a mindfulness activity, which is, mindfulness is of course, learning to be intentional, to be attentive, to being kind and focused and non-judgmental. So we're gonna take a minute to learn one of those examples. This one's called the five senses. 
Notice five things that you can see. They could be anything within your direct vision, anything that you would like to focus your time on and be intentional with that time, but your intention is to focus only on that moment. Notice four things that you feel. Do you feel something on the rib of your pants, your nail, maybe the, the table that you have in front of you? Notice three things that you can hear. What are the sounds outside the door? Is there a sound outside the window? If you have a window in your room. And notice two things that you can smell. Let's avoid the not so good smells and focus on the things that do smell good. Maybe the window is open and there's a smell of uh, the pine tree outside the window. That would be lovely. And then the last thing you'll do is that you'll notice something that you can taste. Now, you're focusing on the moment. So maybe that taste is something that you had to drink earlier. Maybe you had some hot chocolate this morning. That sounds really good, but maybe not so much on a hot day. But it's the thought and the moment that you're focused on. So you've cleared your mind, you're focused, you've calmed a little bit because your thoughts have been very much centered and non-judgmental, and you're ready to take on the rest of your day. Thank you, we'll see you around soon.